and we are recording. So this is going to be a little solution video for the tutorial in week two, Tail Recursive Madness, where we learnt to look at things in that peculiar way that you need to look at them uh, in order to work out a recursive solution to a problem and then to make it a tail recursive solution to a problem. Uh, so, so let's work through this uh, quite quickly in this video. Um, I said let's start with a warm-up and let's do this factorial one uh, that we did in class. Uh, I'm going to repeat that here just so that it is at the beginning of the solution video as well. Um, so I've created a new worksheet and at the moment it's just got a number in it uh, but let's put our definition of factorial in there and so we've got def defined factorial and if we do it fairly naively we can say that factorial of i and we're going to need to specify the return type because this is a, a going to be a recursive function and the type inference won't be able to automatically determine the return type of a recursive function. And we said, well, if i is less than or equal to 1, then it's just 1. And otherwise, it is i times factorial of i minus 1. And so that is going to start off at, you know, if we say factorial of 5, and we run it, and let's save it, just show it works, and we get 120, yes it did. And we can do our thing of imagine if we were rewriting uh, that function each time. So factorial of 5, no, it's not, i is not less than or equal to 1, so it's going to be 5 times factorial of 4, um, rewriting it sorry five it's going to be five times the factorial of four which is going to be four times factorial of three which is going to be three times factorial of two each time just replacing it with uh, with the body of the function because and so I'm doing it the right hand side because I is not less than or equal to one I is still not less than or equal to one so we're going to replace that with 2 times factorial of 2 minus 1, which is 1. And here, finally, we get i is less than or equal to 1, and we can replace that with 1. And so that's kind of how we can imagine this being evaluated by rewriting. Um, and we can see that produces 120. And if we go factorial of 5, we get our 120. However, Let's go and do the thing of trying to make this tail recursive. So let's put the annotation at the top, and we need to import this annotation, scala.annotation.tailrec. And there is our import statement. And as soon as I put that in, it says, actually, no, recursive call not in tail position. And sometimes students look at that and go, but why is that? It's right at the end. I can see it's right at the end. How is that not in tail position? And though as we read it, it looks like it's in tail position, actually, uh, once we've got this factorial, once we've got the return value from that function call, we have to do something more with it. We have to multiply it by i. So it's not the last thing we do, even though it's the last thing lexically in the way that the function is typed out. Um, so to make this tail recursive, we have to make it that actually, no, 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 the last thing we do is just call ourselves and return whatever gets returned with no further operations. And so in class I suggested, well, what if there was some way that this multiplication, instead of it being something that happened after we get the return value, what if it became the case that the multiplication was something that happened when we're sorting the arguments out to pass into factorial? What if we had some extra argument here that was going to collect the value as we recurse? And so we'll start that off with 1, because 1 is the identity value for multiplication. Anything times 1 is 1, just as anything plus 0 is 0, and 0 is the identity value for addition. 1 is the identity value for multiplication. And so let's have it so that we, each time, we multiply that by accumulator. Now, at the moment, this isn't going to work. If I run that, you'll see factorial of 5. Well, it's always returning 1. Why is that? Because when we get to the terminal case, we're still just returning 1. But we've been accumulating our value to return. We've been memoizing it in this, the, the, this value here, uh, accumulator. So let's instead return that. And now we have 120. 
uh, over here and now that is tail recursive that's happy that works okay so that was the warm-up reminding ourselves uh, about tail recursion through the uh, the one we did earlier factorial now the next thing I said to do was to have a look at the Fibonacci sequence and so let's copy our naive definition of the Fibonacci sequence and let's put this in here and remove factorial of 5 because we're no longer doing that and instead we have say Fibonacci of 3 is 3 well what's Fibonacci of 1? it's 1 Fibonacci of 0 is also 1 Fibonacci of 2 is 2 and then we get 3 and then it starts to uh, go up it goes to 5 and 8 and it's, it starts to grow 13, 21 etc um, let's do fib of 7 this is the one that we'll just leave lying around so fib of 7 is 21 ok so here is our naive version of Fibonacci um, as soon as we start getting a bit bigger in this we're going to start having some problems so fib of 16 is ok um, fib of 26 might be alright, number might be getting a bit big um, fib of 36 we might start to be in trouble um, no 36 alright, 46 and oh dear something's gone wrong, 46 it's kind of not really working out for us, something is happening it's taking a while and uh, eventually we get something comes back with a with a with a stack overflow but it, it, it does it looks like a little bit of bad news and one of the reasons is that every time we call fib uh, it wants to call it twice more and as it recurses each of those will want to call it twice more and each of those will want to call it twice more and so the, the calls are growing at 2 to the n so there's an awful lot of calls going on here and it's getting quite slow and we'll also find that we're recomputing the same number over and over again. I mean, if I write out fib of 7, well, fib of 7 is, it's not, i is not less than or equal to 1. So it's instead, it's equal to this. It's equal to fib of i minus 1, fib of 7 minus 1, plus fib of 7 minus 2. So it's equal to fib of 6 plus fib of 5. Um, but if we have a look at fib of 6, well let's um, let's rewrite that part. i is not less than or equal to 1, so that's equal to fib of 6 minus 1 plus fib of 6 minus 2. Uh, so that's equal to fib of 5 plus fib of 4. And you'll kind of notice that, well, we've got fib of 5 there, and we've got fib of 5 here. We're working the same values out over and over again. That's really not very efficient. Um, so instead, let's do some dynamic programming. Let's do some memoization here. And the, uh, the next part of the exercise is, well, over here, let's do this version. Let's do a memoized version where we are going to compute the sequence and remember the sequence so what I've done here um, this function here this is just a function declaration I could take that out I could put it up here it just so happens that in Scala we can put a function declaration inside another function declaration you can do that in JavaScript and several other languages as well <coughs> so locally we're defining another function and then we're going to call it over here. Now, in the tutorial, this the meaning of this line seemed a little bit complicated so uh, to some students. So let's expand that out and explain what it's doing. Memoized here returns a sequence of integers. Um, or at least it will. So let's say that that sequence, and we'll put it into SEQ with a lowercase s. So SEQ is now going to be a sequence of integers. And we're going to return 
the number at the ith position in that sequence. So that's why we're saying sequence of i. But when I was writing the task, I kind of contracted that down. I said, well, all right, I'm not going to bother putting that in a val. I'm just going to say, well, if that is a sequence of integers, then that gets the ith value out of the sequence of integers. Um, sometimes you'll find that when people write in a functional style, they can be very, very terse, and they can be so terse that you have to kind of look at things a bit carefully to check, okay, exactly what's happening there. Um, all right, let's put the sequence back in just in case we decide we want to print it out. Now, up here, um, we've annotated this tail recursive and it's got no tail recursive calls because we, we've not actually implemented it at all. Um, what we're going to say is instead of, uh, so when we did the factorial, we went factorial and we called ourselves for i minus 1 and then i minus 1, uh, and, you know, i minus 2, i minus 3, all the way down to 1, which was our terminal case, and we just exited. In this case, we're going to do something slightly different. We are going to have this one's, whoops, um, many apologies, I just clicked the wrong button, and let's get back to the file that I was in. Sorry about that. I accidentally clicked into the definition of tail recursive. Um, all right. So this time, instead, we're going to have our recursion count up from 0 to i. We're going to treat this value as the target. And we are going to gradually grow the Fibonacci sequence from 0 all the way up to i, collecting it in a sequence. Um, and then, once we've reached our target, we can pull out the ith element and return it. And the reason that we're going to do this is because if we say that fib of i is, um, if that is fib of i minus 1 plus fib of i minus 2, then if I have a sequence with all of the previous values in it, well, that is is just looking it up in the sequence. Sequence of i minus 1 plus sequence of i minus 2. I can get out the, the, the previous results and I can get that value and I can make that be what sequence of i is going to be. Um, and so is going to be... Okay. Uh, but as we do that, so we're going to keep doing that from 0 all the way up except, okay, but what about sequence of 1? Well, it's not going to be sequence of 0 plus sequence of minus 1. I'm going to have to put in the situation where i is less than or equal to 1. But So we, we are going to recursively grow our sequence until we reach our target. And so that's why we're starting off at the beginning and we're saying, well, okay, our target is i. And actually, that's a slight mistake. I'll show you why in a moment. Uh, but we're going to start from zero and we're starting with an empty sequence. And at each step, we're going to grow the Fibonacci sequence until we get to our target i and then, then we're going to return it. Okay, so what do I want to say? So I want to say, well, if we reached our target, then we've collected everything and let's return it. If we haven't reached our target, then we want to recurse, we want to call memoized, and we're still heading towards the same target, but we want but we, 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 we've made a step, we've made a, a step forwards up from zero, and we're going to want it to be the sequence appended with, Ooh, what do we want to append it with? We want to append it with the next value in the Fibonacci sequence. Right, so what's the next value in the Fibonacci sequence? Then, well, normally, uh, normally, if i is big enough, so we're going to need some kind of an if, then it's going to be... And I just said it up here. We're going to be able to look it up. We, we'll, we'll have those values already in our array. And so we'll be able to say, well, if we've got far enough, it's just sequence of i minus 1 plus sequence of i minus 2. Um, 
but that's only if i is greater than or equal to two because other because we can't look up the minus oneth element and otherwise what is it well what's the beginning of the you know what's the first two elements in the fibonacci sequence it starts off one one so otherwise it's one and in this case i think i've put my whoops dot plus colon or colon plus we'll find out which y oh it's because i've missed a t out of next val um let's see if this is right no plus colon to append to the end all right so that's defined our memoized function and we're calling it now let's just try calling it with fib of zero fib of zero should be one blast i've got an index out of bounds exception where have i got my index out of bounds exception my index out of bounds exception is occurring in this worksheet at um uh oh i'm not showing my line numbers on here am i is there a way of getting me to show the line numbers um sorry this is my my screen is set up a little bit differently okay i will tell you what my guess is as to the problem i've hit i think and let's just test this if i go plus one that's going to go away yes so the problem i was hitting was i was calling fib of zero and we've got an empty sequence and it goes um that the next val um, and so it goes well target yes we've reached our target and so it returns the sequence which is still empty and then we index the the zero you know the beginning element out of it but it's empty so we're going to get index out of bounds exception and in fact i had an off by one error in there um the, the way i'd set it up uh each time it would grow it up until just before the one we wanted uh because as soon as target you know suppose target was four well we wouldn't put that element in there we'd return it with the uh, ones for for zero to three um so i need to tell it no no no, do this for i plus one uh when i call the memo memo sequence and that should now work and so what's fib of six is 13 fib of seven was 21 we said uh fib of 36 was something starting to get pretty big etc uh, fib of 46 shouldn't take so much longer but oh dear negative no the 46th fibonacci number is not negative it's just that and here's where i'm going to pop back to our um uh, back to the assignment description the uh the values in the fibonacci sequence grow by approximately 1.6 to the power n the ratio of any two fibonacci numbers it tends towards what they call the golden ratio 1.6 lots of numbers so um we're going to need to do something about that now we'd have a problem that long although it gives us a whole bunch of extra a whole bunch of extra bits in our integer if we're growing at order of 1.6 to the power of n we're going to overflow that uh, not very much later you know maybe 40 iterations later or something so uh, let's instead change this so it uses big ints uh, these are integers that are arbitrarily long and the thing I say to do in the assignment, uh, or at least for the students on campus, was to be careful about when you're talking about your indexes, which can remain in integers. We're still only saying, you know, fib of 43, fib of 44. It's not that 43, 44, etc. is getting huge. It's the result, the value that's coming back that's starting to get big. Uh, so we want to say that this is going to return a big int, but it's still only just going to take an int. Um, now we should start thinking well okay that means that um this memoized one here we're going to need to return a sequence of big ints because those are going to be our fibonacci uh, number being, uh, numbers being memoized so this one needs to be a sequence of big ints 
and now we start to hit this funny problem that we're getting an error down here and this if I put my mouse over it, it says expected a sequence of begins actually got a sequence of any and that's the type inference at work again up here we've said next val is and in this one it's okay it's a big int plus a big int and that's a big int but otherwise we've said it's a one which is just an int so it's some so at the moment the type inference thinks well oh okay it's got to be able to accept a big int and it's got to be able to accept an int uh, so their common parent type is any so we're, we're, we're producing an, an any there and uh, that's not really what we want. We want a big int of one here uh, because we want next val to be of type big int. And so now that's happy, but down here I haven't changed this one to be big int. And now that is, and now if I see what Fibonacci of uh, 46 is, we're getting that number. Let's go and see what 66 is. And maybe if we go 166, and we can get some arbitrarily big uh, Fibonacci numbers out of our tail recursive method that's using big ints. All right, let's now pop back across to here. So we, we've done this one. Now, the next step I said was to have a look at Pascal's triangle. And um, if you recall, in class, I said that we'd start off doing Pascal's triangle um, just by dealing with this question of, well, okay, if we're going from one line to the next, then effectively what we're doing, so for, for this line it was effectively, let's change that 1 into a 0, 1 and a 1, 0 and add them together to get a 1, 1. And so I said that, this, well, okay, this first thing that we might need is something to add two lists together and it takes a list of ints and it takes a list of ints and it returns a list of ints and I said well let's do this uh, recursively as well because we haven't done higher order functions yet and so it was well if um, a is empty or b is empty because uh, we're, we're, we're just going to assume that these are the same lengths for the moment. We won't do uh, completely proper error handling. Then we're just going to return the empty list. Otherwise, we want to return, um, what was it? It was a dot head plus b dot head const onto the beginning of adding their tails together. add lists and so if we were to do for instance add list of our 0 1 and our list of 1 0 sorry add lists and has that run that's not run let's click play to run it then we get our 1 1 and similarly if we go if we do the 1 1 plus 1 1 0 uh, oops sorry it tried to run it while I was still editing then we get our 1 2 1 okay so this is now adding the two lists but this isn't tail recursive yet so I said let's make this tail recursive and it's going to complain oh but you're doing something here and we were going to do the same trick where we have some parameter that we accumulate our um, values in and it's going to start off empty and instead of doing our cons outside the call we're going to do it in the argument to the call and then in our terminal case we need to not return nil, we need to return whatever we've accumulated. And now we've got it working tail recursively and still adding the two lists together. And then the next thing I said we'd do was to do, well, okay, so what's the, let's just work out what the next fragment is. The next fragment was to work out um, 
what's the next line of Pascal's triangle. So suppose we've got the previous line, which is our um, list of integers. Then the next line we said was going to be adding the lists from of uh, putting zero onto the beginning of, pre of the previous line and uh, previous line with zero on the end. And I think I've got my colons and pluses the wrong way around. Okay, and so now we can just see, okay, so next line of the list of say one, two, one, and that is going to produce one, three, three, one. Okay, so, so far so good. We can work out the next line of Pascal's triangle and we can go and if we want we can hide that function definition inside our definition of ne next line and it will still work it'll still be in scope when we want to go and call it and now then what do we want to do well we want to do the bit for pascal's triangle itself so pascal of i being an integer and we're going to return a list of list of integers because we're going to return the whole triangle up to that row equals and so let's start off naively if i less than or equal to zero well we start off just with a triangle that's got one row and it's got one number in it else then otherwise we want to put uh what do we want to put we want to um we're going to say that it is uh, the next line of the end of Pascal's triangle plus the rest of Pascal's triangle. Let's just go val, um, if you like, one line smaller equals Pascal of i minus one. <clears throat> and then we want to uh, return the next line of one line smaller. Um, but it's the next line of the head but so one line smaller there that is a list of lists that is the whole triangle that's all of the rows not just all of the numbers um, so we work out the next line from the last line of the, of the of the triangle if it's one line smaller so if we've got if you like one line smaller might be holding one 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 and we just wanted to grab one one to work out what the next line would be to work out that it's one two one and then we want to put that on the head of it so next line of one line smaller dot head on the end of one line smaller and so that is our very naive non tail recursive version of uh, Pascal and so you go Pascal of three and we should now get the first say three lines and so there we go there's sorry there's line zero there's line one there's line two and there's line three and they're all in a list and so that's all working but once again this bit is not yet tail recursive oh how are we going to make it tail recursive um well here's it complaining that that needs to be in tail position so somehow we want to do all of this in some kind of an accumulator so accumulator which is going to be a list of list of integers and uh, in this case we're going to start off with the base case which is the triangle that is one line long just containing the number one and so then what we can say is that um, if we've got down to the beginning then we return the accumulator otherwise well now our one line smaller is this pascal of i minus one well actually we've been passed that in we've been we've been collecting the one line smallers in here so we don't need that that's just accumulator um, and so that's going to be 
accumulator.head, next line of accumulator.head is going to give us what the next line is. And so we're going to go Pascal of I um, minus one. Oops, let me crib back on my notes. And next line here of accumulator.head, that's the next line we're putting in it on whatever we've accumulated. That's right, I just momentarily doubted myself. There we go. And that is now tail recursive. And that is producing what we were after. So we've kind of gone through this weird process where we've been um, doing it not tail recursive and then doing a memoization trick to uh, to turn it tail recursive. Okay, we did that one in class. Um, let's now.